Ah yes, the obligatory Star Wars animation torture plot. Every series has to have at least one. Welcome back to Rebels Revisited. We are so close to finishing season one. This has been so much fun for me. And seriously, thank you guys for following along. You are the ones who have made this so much fun. And I really appreciate you all. Without further ado, this is Rebel Resolve Revisited. The opening scene is a lot of fun. Rebels does action sequences like this really well. It, it's very creatively planned out and it happens at an exciting pace and there's even some humor here and there thrown in the action. How you doing? Oh, here, take this! Here, take this! And he just, he just hands him a whole person and Seb just... Yeet! I'm sorry. <laughs> But although this scene is fun, it serves a serious purpose. They're trying to find out information on Kanan. I like that they have a moment that's fun to watch that still moves the plot forward. You know, I don't mind that this episode starts out with a more fun sequence because the B-plot is decidedly not fun. And I like that we have that tonal balance. Speaking of that not fun B-plot, Right in the middle of this high energy action sequence, we cut to Kanan strapped to the torture table. I don't know how long he's been there, but he seems so tired. It doesn't appear that Tarkin has started torturing him yet, but like, oh my god, he already seems messed up. Just uh, listen. Well, Governor, somebody's gotta keep you entertained. Did they drug him? They drugged Hera in season 4 and that was made clear, and it's not explicit in this case, but would they have drugged Kanan too? Anyway, it's just very hard to see him like this, and it only gets harder. Alright, so then Hera has a conversation with Fulcrum, and you know what? It's so obvious that it's Ahsoka now that I know it's Ahsoka. The speech pattern and inflection is so distinct, listen. At what cost? You, your unit, the overall mission? There's something else, Hera. The transmission Ezra was able to beam out has attracted attention. This really tells you how iconic Ashley Eckstein's voice is and how it is deeply paired with the identity of Ahsoka. Like the audio, it's all warped and the pitch is altered, you know, all of that, but yet it's still unmistakably her. Hera's reaction to all this is really interesting. Fulcrum tells her that she can't risk rescuing Kanan for the good of her cell and therefore the rebellion. Hera understands this, but she's having a lot of trouble letting Kanan go. She clearly hates having to leave him with the Empire. She tells her crew the same thing that Fulcrum told her, but her heart's not in it. She's just saying what she knows she's supposed to say. Hera is usually the one to trust the Rebellion and to do anything in the best interest of the Rebellion, but this is different. The team is so broken up over Kanan being in the hands of the Empire. Chopper is so worked up and upset. Zeb says, why prepare to fight if we're not even going after Kanan? And they know he's alive too. They're feeling these things when they know he's alive. It gives me a new perspective on how deep their pain was after Jedi Knight because this is sort of a point of reference. We see how they feel when he's simply not with them, when he's in trouble but still alive. So how much deeper was it when uh, he wasn't? Why did I put this in? I don't want to talk about this. What's next? Not that this is happier, but when Sabine wonders if Kanan will reveal any information, Hera says he doesn't know anything, and she sounds so sad, and Sabine and Zeb look so worried, and in this moment, it, it dawns on all of us, ghost crew and audience alike, how much torture the Empire would put him through, because they will torture him until he gives answers, answers he doesn't have. So they'll torture him until, you know, he can't answer anymore. God, this screws me up. Let's be happy for two seconds. This is depressing. Let's look at the pretty sunset. Now back to not being happy as the episode cuts over to Kanan. It's electrocution time, baby. Let's like acknowledge this line. Pain 
the Jedi still feels pain, and pain can break anyone. The Inquisitor's dialogue has no business going that hard, and yet every word he speaks goes that hard. This scene is more intense than we give it credit for. Like, the only reason this feels like a kid show is because of the way it looks. The subject matter, dialogue, and acting could be taken right out of a live action drama, okay? Like, look at Kanan struggling against the Inquisitor. Listen to Freddie Prince Jr. deliver this line. I see. <sighs> and more frustrated. You can feel the menace of the electrocution device. The smoke in the air? Kanan's anguished screams that bounce off of the cold, cruel, calculating visages of those observing? Throwback to me being roughly 13 and being traumatized by this? The torture scenes were honestly not written and directed like a kid show. They were just written and directed. Speaking of which, this is about to get a little bit tangenty, but speaking of which, I need to shout out the writers and director behind this one because they're freaking awesome and so underappreciated. We love what they do, and yet you never hear their names, so let's hear their names. The director is Justin Ridge, who I literally appreciate so much. He directed both parts of Zero Hour and the episodes Rookies and Innocence of Ryloth on The Clone Wars. He was also an executive producer and supervising director on Resistance a change of pace, but hey, the guy has range. I know he's worked really closely with Dave Filoni and even took his place as supervising director on Rebels when Dave was promoted beyond that. And the writers of this one are Charles Murray and Henry Gilroy. Charles Murray wrote the Ahsoka Leaves arc and on Rebels, he did Path of the Jedi. Such incredible work, literally like some of the best that Star Wars animation has to offer. And Henry Gilroy a creative king. He goes all the way back to developing the Clone Wars, which he did alongside George Lucas and Dave Filoni themselves. Um, he was head writer on season one, and he did great work on the series. Like he did the Ryloth arc, um, and I know he did the Kadavo arc too, like such great work, but his work on Rebels is jaw dropping. He was co-executive producer on Rebels from season two, I think, and he worked on like the best episodes. I always say to myself that when you see that Henry Gilroy and Dave Filoni are teamed up for an episode, you know what's gonna hit hard. Let me just list some of what he's done, all right? Shroud of Darkness, Holocrons of Faith, Through Imperial Eyes, Twin Sons, Jedi Knight, Family Reunion and Farewell. Again, a lot of these he did as a team with Dave, and they are a god-tier team. God-tier. I just really wanted to say that because Dave Filoni is not the only person making magic here, but we kind of only talk about him. There are a lot of incredible creators who we just never talk about. All right, moving on. I really admire Ezra's determination in trying to find Kanan, but the riskiness of his actions proves how immature and desperate he still is. His deal with Fazago is a risky one, not only revealing himself and Kanan as Jedi, but promising an unconditional favor. He still has a long way to go before he reaches the inner balance of a Jedi. Okay, so this part. None of us want to give up on Kanan. And you think I do? The way Hera snaps, and you think I do? Like, she's struggling with this. Her devotion to the Rebellion is arguably the driving force in her life, but her love for Kanan is the one thing that can go head to head with it. He's the crack in her tough rebel leader self. He's the one thing she'll be selfish about. That's another thing that's shown on a much larger scale in the aftermath of Jedi Knight. It was almost shocking how hard Hera hit rock bottom in Doom but to look back on her in this episode, it lines up. Are we back to Kanan already? I love how the B-plot of this episode is literally just Kanan getting tortured. His screams haunt me to this day. <laughs> Tarkin literally says, the Jedi is no good to be dead. They're trying to kill me. Like, oh my God, Kanan was in so much pain. The cruelty is staggering. I tend to be sensitive to torture if you can't tell. Like, it doesn't have to be gratuitously violent or gory or anything, like, it's just, it's the concept. It's the idea of it. 
so this point in the series is always rough for me. <laughs> like I see the way the smoke rises from his body and it takes every fiber of my being to not start crying. But this is what I mean when I say Rebels commits to its swings. People compare Rebels to the Clone Wars with the basic argument of Rebels should have had more big serious moments. People say there weren't enough like deaths or events similar to that scope in Rebels. But that's not a fair comparison. Hear me out. Rebels doesn't take big swings often, but when they do, they commit to them. When Kanan got captured, his torture spanned two episodes. Then take stuff like Twilight of the Apprentice. That was huge, and they committed to the fallout. Kanan got blinded and didn't bounce back immediately, and also never magically regained his sight for plot convenience or the comfort of the audience. Both him and Ezra changed drastically after Twilight of the Apprentice. Uh, and then of course there's Jedi Knight. They reserved the entire next episode solely to deal with the ghost crew grieving. And that grief was also a huge part of World Between Worlds and it wasn't even truly resolved until the finale. Like that's commitment. The show understands that realistically serious events do damage and it takes time to resolve them. Because of the introspective and emotional nature of Rebels, their big moments hit hard. They also hit hard because the show is always focused on its core characters, so we get to know them like friends, and it hurts like heck when bad things happen to them. Even the lighthearted episodes make it hit harder when the show gets less lighthearted. The nature of Rebels makes it so you aren't desensitized to things like torture and death and pain. There's a reason why having less grit and less frequent devastation works for the show, and that reason is that it understands the commitment required for such things. All right, let's lighten up. Look at Chopper. Straight zooming. My favorite Chopper the Murder Droid moment is in this one. This is quintessential Chopper the Murder Droid. <laughs> it's the way he laughs after it. And I won't lie. The droid with the loth cats in the field is very pretty. It's a very pretty picture. The background is very Clone Wars season one. And finally, when Sabine said that Kanan was being taken to the Mustafar system, it rocked my middle school world. I feel like I remember sliding off my couch because I was so overwhelmed. And I think that about wraps it up. The next episode finishes up season one. So be there. Thanks for watching, and may the force be with you always.